when you were at Caltech, did you get to interact with Richard Feynman at all? Do you have any oh, memories yeah. Yeah, of we, Richard? We we worked together quite a bit actually. Um, in fact, on um, and in fact, both when I was at Caltech and after I left Caltech, we were both um, consultants at this company called Thinking Machines Corporation, which was just down the street from here actually, mm -hmm. um, as ultimately ill-fated company, but. Um, I used to say this company is not going to work with the strategy they have. And Dick Feynman always used to say, what do we know about running companies? Just let them run their company. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I was, uh, <laughs> he, he was not into, into that kind of thing. And he always thought, he always thought that my interest in doing things like running companies was a, was a distraction, so to speak. Um, and uh, I, for me, it's a, it's a mechanism to have uh, uh, a more effective machine for actually uh, getting things, figuring things out and getting things to happen. Did he think of it? Because essentially what you used, you did with the company, I don't know if you were thinking of it that way, but you're creating tools to empower your, to empower the exploration of, of the universe. Do you think, did he? Did he understand that point? The, the point of tools of? I think not as well as he might have done. I mean, I think that, but, you know, he was actually my first company which was also involved with, well, was involved with more mathematical computation kinds of things. Um, uh, you know, he was quite, he had lots of advice about the technical side of what we should do and so on. Um, do you have and, examples, memories, or thoughts that? Oh, yeah, yeah. He had all kinds of, look, he, uh, in, in the business of doing sort of, uh, you know, one of the hard things in math is doing integrals and so on, right? Mm -hmm. And so he had his own elaborate ways to do integrals and so on. He had his own ways of thinking about sort of getting intuition about how math works. And so his sort of meta idea was take those intuitional methods and make a computer follow those intuitional methods. Now, it turns out, uh, for the most part, like when we do integrals and things, what we do is is we build this kind of bizarre industrial machine that turns every integral into you know products of Mayer G functions and generates this very elaborate thing. And actually, the big problem is turning the results into something a human will understand. It's not quotes doing the integral. And actually, Feynman did understand that to some extent. And I, I I'm embarrassed to say I, I, he once gave me this big pile of you know calculational methods for particle physics that he worked out in the 50s. And he said, you know, it's more used to you than to me type thing. And I and I was like, I intended to look at it and give it back. And I still have my files now. So <laughs> it's, uh, but uh, that's what happens when, when it's finiteness of human lives. It, um, I, you know, maybe if he'd lived another 20 years, I would have, I would have remembered to give it back. But I, I think um, uh, it's, you know, that, that was his attempt to systematize, um, the ways that one does integrals that show up in particle physics and so on. Turns out the way we've actually done it is very different from that way. What do you make of that difference between, so Feynman was actually quite remarkable at creating sort of intuitive, like diving in, you know, creating intuitive frameworks for understanding difficult concepts. Is, I'm, is, I'm smiling because, you know, the funny thing about him was that the thing he was really, really, really good at is calculating stuff. And, but he thought that was easy because he was really good at it. And so he would do these things where he would calculate some, uh, do some complicated calculation in quantum field theory, for example, come out with a result. Wouldn't tell anybody about the complicated calculation because he thought that was easy. He thought the really impressive thing was to have this simple intuition about how everything works. So he invented that at the end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because he'd done this calculation and knew what, how it worked, it was a lot easier. It's a lot easier to have good intuition when you know what the answer is. <laughs> and, and, then, and then he would just not tell anybody about these calculations. And yeah. he wasn't meaning that maliciously, so to speak. It's just he thought that was easy. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that's, you know, that led to areas where people were just completely mystified and they kind of followed his intuition, but nobody could tell why it worked. Because actually the reason it worked was because he'd done all these calculations and he knew that it was would work. And, you know, when I, he and I worked a bit on quantum computers, actually, back in 1980, 81, um, but before anybody had heard of those things. And, you know, the typical mode of, um, uh, I mean, he always used to say, and I now think about this because I'm about the age that he was when I worked with him. And, you know, I see the people who are one third my age, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was always complaining that I was one third his age and therefore <laughs> uh, various things. But, but, um, you know, he would do some calculation by by hand, you know, on blackboard and things, come up with some answer. I'd say, I don't understand this. 
you know, I do something with a computer and he'd say, you know, I don't understand this. So there'd be some big argument about what was, you know, what was going on. But but it was always some, um, uh, and I think actually we, the, many of the things that we sort of realized about quantum computing that were sort of issues that have to do particularly with the measurement process are kind of still issues today. And I kind of find it interesting. It, it's a funny thing in, in science that these, you know, that there's uh, there's a remarkable, it happens in technology too, there's a remarkable sort of repetition of history that ends up occurring. Um, eventually things really get nailed down, but it often takes a while and it often, things come back decades later. Um, well, for example, I could tell a story actually happened right down the street from here. Um, uh, when we were both at Thinking Machines, I had been working on this particular cellular automaton called Rule 30 that has this feature that it, from very simple initial conditions, it makes really complicated behavior, okay? So, and actually, of all silly physical things, uh, using this big parallel computer called a connection machine that that company was making, I generated this giant printout of Rule 30 on very, on actually on the same kind of, um, same kind of printer that people use to make, um, uh, uh, layouts for microprocessors. So one of these big, you know, large format printers with uh, high resolution and so on. So, okay, so we print this out, lots of very tiny cells. And, um, so there was sort of a question of, of how, um, uh, some features of that pattern. And so it was very much a physical, you know, on the floor with meter rules trying to measure different things. Mm -hmm. So, so Feynman kind of takes me aside. We've been doing that for a little while and takes me aside and he says, I just want to know this one thing. He says, I want to know, how did you know that this Rule 30 thing would produce all this really complicated behavior that is so complicated that we're, you know, going around with this big printout and so on? And I said, well, I didn't know. I just enumerated all the possible rules and then observed that that's what happened. He said, ah, oh, I feel a lot better. You know, I thought you had some intuition that he didn't have. Hmm. That would let one. I said, no, 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 no intuition, just experimental science. Oh, that's such a beautiful sort of dichotomy there of that's exactly what you showed is you really can't have an intuition about an irreducible, I mean, you have to run yes. it. Yes, that's right. That's so hard for us humans and especially a brilliant physicists like Feynman to say that you can't have a uh, compressed, clean intuition about how the whole thing yes. works. Yes, no, he was, I mean, I think he was sort of on the edge of understanding that point about computation. And I think he found that, I think he, he always found computation interesting. And I think that was sort of what he was a little bit poking at. I mean, yeah. that intuition, you know, the difficulty of discovering things, like even you say, oh, you know, you just enumerate all the cases and you just find one that does something interesting, right? Sounds very easy. Turns out, like, I missed it when I first saw it because I had kind of an intuition that said it shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So I had kind of arguments, oh, I'm going to ignore that case because whatever. Um, and uh, How did you have an open mind enough? Because you're essentially the same person as Richard Feynman, like the same kind of physics type of thinking. How did you find yourself having a sufficiently open mind to be open to watching rules and them revealing complexity? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I've wondered about that myself, because it's kind of like, you know, you live through these things and then you say, what was the historical story? And sometimes the historical story that you realize after the fact was not what you lived through, so to speak. And um, so, you know, what I realized is I think what happened is, you know, I did physics kind of like reductionistic physics where you're thrown the universe and you're told, go figure out what's going on inside it. And then I started building computer tools and I started building my first computer language, for example. And computer language is not like, it's sort of like physics in the sense that you have to take all those computations people want to do and kind of drill down and find the primitives that they can all be made of. But then you do something that's really different because you're just, you're just saying, okay, these are the primitives. Now, you know, hopefully they'll be useful to people. Let's build up from there. So you're essentially building an artificial universe in a sense where you make this language, you've got these primitives, you're just building whatever you feel like building. Mm -hmm. And that's, and, and so it was sort of interesting for me because from doing science where you're just throwing the universe as the universe is to then just being uh, told, you know, you can make up any universe you want. 
And so I think that experience of, of making a computer language, which is essentially building your own universe, so to speak, is, uh, you know, that's kind of the, um, uh, that's, that's what gave me a somewhat different attitude towards what might be possible. It's like, let's just explore what can be done in these artificial universes rather than thinking the natural science way of let's be constrained by how the universe actually is. Yeah, by being able to program, essentially you've, uh, as opposed to being limited to just your mind and a pen, you you now have, you've basically built another brain that you can use to explore the universe by yeah, the, yeah. The computer like, program, you know, is right. a kind of a brain. Right, and it's, well, it's, it's or a telescope or, you know, it's a tool, yeah, it's it's, a tool. it lets you, lets you see stuff. But there's something fundamentally different between a computer and a telescope, I mean, it just, yeah, I'm hoping yeah, not to is. romanticize the notion, but it's more general. The it computer is, is, is more general. More than general. The telescope. And it, it's, it's, I think, I mean, this point about, um, you know, people say, oh, such and such a thing was almost discovered at such and such a time. The, the distance between, you know, the building the paradigm that allows you to actually understand stuff or allows one to be open to seeing what's going on, that's really hard. And, you know, I think in, I've been fortunate in my life that I've spent a lot of my time building computational language, and that's uh, an activity that, in a sense, works by sort of having to uh, kind of create another level of abstraction and kind of be open to different kinds of structures. But you know, it's it's always. Um, I mean, I'm I'm fully aware of. I suppose the fact that I have seen it a bunch of times of how easy it is to miss the obvious, so to speak. That at least is is factored into my attempt to not miss the obvious, um, although it may not succeed. <laughs>